Well, we continue on in our study today uh, of the church, and I just want to ask you a question. If you woke up tomorrow and you went down to the breakfast table and you began to eat breakfast and all of a sudden your hands just stopped working and you had to figure out how to eat breakfast with your elbows or you had to figure out how your feet were going to function now for you as hands, you would think that something was seriously wrong with you. If you were having a business call and you were on the phone talking to somebody and all of a sudden your mouth just decided it wasn't going to work anymore, it was done for the day, you would think something is not right here. And if you got up from work and decided to go home, but one leg decided they wanted to go home and the other decided they wanted to stay and you would have serious problems on your hands, right? And and, and you know that that's silly. That's never going to happen to you. Why? Because your body functions as one. Because the individual parts don't decide what they're going to do tomorrow, your brain tells your body what to do and your body follows your brain. And this picture is the picture that Paul has for the church of God. This metaphor that he uses, and it, it captures even more than just a sentence can explain. He tries to capture this picture for us that the body of Christ is the church. The church is the body. And the main idea that Paul tries to get across with this illustration is the fact that we are unified. We are unified with Christ and we are unified with one another. Last week, we looked at the church as a family. We saw the, all the implications that, that that meant, that we are a family. This morning, we want to look at the church as a body and understand what does God want us to understand from this this metaphor, this word picture that we find in the scripture. Now, there are two primary ways that Paul uses this illustration of the body as he describes the church in the scripture. The first is that the body is a beautiful picture of the church's unity with Christ. And the second is that the body is a beautiful picture of the church's unity with one another. And so let's take a look at the first one together. The body is a beautiful picture of the church's unity with Christ. Now there are three primary passages where Paul expresses this idea that the unity that the church has with Christ is best seen in the idea of the head and the body of the human body. They are in Colossians 1.18 in Colossians 2, 19, and in Ephesians 5, 23 through 30. And I want to look briefly at these passages. We won't be able to dive into all that's there, but I want you to catch the main idea of what Paul is trying to say when he uses this metaphor of the church and the body. Let's look at Colossians 1, 18 to begin with there. And we find this. He says, and he, Christ, is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now, Paul is writing uh, the church of Colossae to address the false teachers and the false teaching that has crept into the church. And in chapter 1, starting in verse 15, Paul begins to say that Christ is superior. He's superior to all things, to all teaching, to all ways. You need to return to Christ. And in that, he reminds them that that Christ is superior over the church. And to describe this, he uses this illustration of the head and the body. He says he is the head of the body. And Paul is expressing here the unity that Christ has with his church. You, You can't have a body without a head, right? That just doesn't exist. It's a... It's a, it's a Halloween, you know, scare. It's, it's not reality. It's not, uh, it's not a body. It's a corpse. And so you have to have a body and a head. And he says Christ is the head. And, and he expresses here the authority that Christ has over the church. The head directs the body, does it not? The body serves the head. The head tells the hands where to go. And the hands listen. 
The head tells the feet where to go, and the feet listen. There's authority that is being expressed here, leadership that is being expressed here. And Paul is saying the church serves Christ. Christ is the head of his church. Now, these themes are expanded on later on in Colossians chapter 2. If you turn there, you'll see in verse 19, Paul comes back to this illustration, and he says this. And he's talking about false teachers here, and he says, And they, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Now, Paul's addressing the false teachers that have brought in all this error into the church, and, 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 and he's expressing that, that, that they need, the church needs to turn back to Christ. That if they want to grow, if they want to live, if they want to receive life, they must be attached to Christ. In verse 18, we see some context there. Paul says this, he says, Let no one disqualify you, talking about the church, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head. These false teachers, he says, are, are puffed up in their own thinking because they have turned away from Christ and they have turned to their own bizarre ideas, the worship of angels, asceticism. He's saying the head here, of course, is Christ, right? We saw that in chapter one. And Paul's emphasis here is that the, the source of all life, the source of all growth is Christ. When the body ignores the head, it dies. Right? We know with the human body that all of the food that we eat goes in through our mouth. We know that the air that we breathe comes in through our mouth and then it's distributed to the rest of our body. This is the normal way things work. It is the head that receives all of the life and disperses it. And Paul is saying that Christ is the head, the source of life. Look back at verse 19. He says, the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and its ligaments. It grows with a growth that is from God. Paul is emphasizing that the church must be unified with Christ to receive any life and to receive any direction. Now, the other place that Paul uses this idea of the head and the body is in Ephesians chapter 5. And so if you want to turn there, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, we go to uh, verse 23 through 30. And I just want to acknowledge that this passage is very sensitive in our cultural time, in our cultural moment. There, this passage has been used uh, to cause abuse. Uh, and this passage has been chosen, uh, has been said by some to be irrelevant because it's no longer relevant to our time or our culture. And both of those are, are false and errors. And I don't have enough time to go into every minute detail of this passage. I would just encourage you, if you want to know more of what this passage means and says, go to our series on Ephesians. I walked through this in a number of weeks teaching through this section. But I want you to catch the main idea that Paul is talking about here in the idea of the head and the body and the unity that they have in such a way that they, they cherish one another and that the head cherishes the body. Listen to Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse 23. Paul says this, For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Paul says that Christ is the head of the church. 
his body. And here he's pointing, showing again this idea of unity that the body and the head have together. They are one. They are one in such a way that they feel together, right? And, and, and he emphasizes this is how marriage should be, that when we become one flesh, that we're in such a way that, that we care for one another, we think of the other more than ourselves. And here he gives this picture of Christ and the church saying that Christ loves the church and gave himself up for the church. It emphasizes this unity that, that when one is harmed, the other is harmed. When one is blessed, the other is blessed. Verse 49, look at, or sorry, verse 29. Look at verse 29 again. He says in verse 29, for no one has ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. And so he, he emphasizes this idea of unity. We are one with Christ. It also emphasizes the way that Christ leads, right? We see again here that he is the head who leads in a loving way. Now, Christ leads perfectly because he loves us perfectly. Husbands, we fail and we need Christ desperately to help us. But he, he, he says here, Christ gently, humbly, lovingly leads the church. So in these passages, Paul expresses to us that the, the church is a body, and Christ is the head. And through this metaphor, there's many, many implications, but I want to point out two of them to you this morning and allow us to dwell on these two for just a bit. Number one, Christ is the source of all life for the church. Christ is the source of all life for the church. The idea of the head and the body is is such a graphic picture, is it not? That without a head, you are dead. I didn't even even try to rhyme that. That just happened. (laughs) Without a head, there's no no life. There's no life apart from Christ. Without Christ, a church is just a building filled with people. It's not the church. Christ makes the church. If people gather together just to have relationships, if they gather together just for social needs, if they gather together because it's tradition and they've always done it, but there is no gospel, there is no Christ, there is no church. Christ makes the church. And the only way that we enter into the church is through Christ. We enter by faith in Christ. We don't enter into the church by our good deeds. We don't enter into the church by by just attending a building. We enter into the church through faith in Jesus Christ. And friends, I just have to pause for a moment and ask you, have you personally trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you acknowledged him as Lord? Have you recognized him as Savior? Have you realized your need for him and realized that, that apart from him, You are facing an eternal destiny of death and and God is reaching out and saying, I have life. This life is found through Christ Jesus. If you will acknowledge your need for him, recognize that your sin has separated you from him. Recognize that he died in your place and for your sins and call out to him as Lord and Savior. Express your faith in him and walk with him. Christ will be your Lord and Savior. And by doing so, you enter into his body, his church. If you've never done that, I just want to encourage you. What are you you waiting for? What what are you looking for, longing for? It it is in Christ. If you want to talk more about that, I would be happy to, to do that either after the service or meet you at another time to help you understand what the Bible says about Jesus. And there's so many others in this room that would love to do that as well. But each person must make that decision. Is Christ your Lord? That's how we enter into the church. But how do we grow in the church? Well, it's it's the same. We grow in the church through abiding in Christ. John 15, 4-5 says, 
This is Jesus talking to his disciples who are the foundation of the church. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. For I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now this is spoken to individual Christians, but it's also spoken collectively to us as his church, as his body. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Maybe you've been out working in the garden like many of us, and you've been hacking you know, the branches off the trees, trying to get, get ready for the winter season. And as you hack those off, they are now dead. There's no life. There's no hope. And, and Jesus says, if you are not connected to me, there is no life. There's no life in the world apart from Christ. There's no life in money. There's no life in entertainment. There's no life in any of the things that the world tries to say, hey, follow this, you'll find life. Christ says there's only life in Christ Jesus. The only way we do anything of value as a church is abide in Christ. And so friends, what are you doing to abide in Christ? Is he, is he primary in your life? Are you making time in your life to spend in his word, to hear from him and to come to him and to lay your requests before him and to acknowledge your fears with him? Or are you just so busy that Christ has little room in your life? If you are not abiding in Christ, maybe you can get by for a few weeks, left out of the reserves that you've had, but eventually you will begin to spiritually die because you have no life apart from Christ. I want to encourage you this morning that the Spirit of God would, that, that you would abide in Christ. And with Him, you, you would find lo the love and affection that He desires to give you. Are you resting in Christ right now? Or are you filling your mind with the anxiety of this world? You know, some of the best things that some of us can do is just turn off all the noise it just is throwing anxiety into your life. And come back to Christ and abide with your good God who loves you. You know, he's got a good plan. He's at work. He's on the throne. He is accomplishing something that you and I could never imagine. And every day we need to come back and we need to recognize, God, your kingdom, your kingdom is eternal. You are king of kings and lord of lords. And you are at work, and so I will rest in you. I don't understand everything that's going on. I don't understand the stock market or the economy or the policy. I don't get it. But God, you are sovereign, and you are good. We need to abide in God's word, find rest and joy. It is the source of life. Christ is the source of all life for us and for the church. And the second thing I want you to see is that Christ is the source of all authority for the church. Just as the brain controls the human body, tells it where to go, what to do, what message to speak, Christ is our authority. He leads the church. He directs the church. He tells it what to do and where to go and how to do it. He gives it her message and her purpose. It is Christ's church, and we can never Forget that. He promises to build his church in Matthew 16, 18 that we've looked at. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know how comforting that is? That we don't have to try to invent ways to, to sucker people into the church. We don't have to try to be the slickest thing. Now, now, we should be good missionaries, and we should know our culture, and we should engage our culture well, but we should ultimately trust in God's word and in God's spirit that he will build his church, that if we are faithful to him, that he will be the one that brings about his glory in our midst. Friends, we just have to be faithful to his word and let him build and let him lead He's given us a message. We don't have to make it up. Let's be faithful to proclaim his message 
Let's share the gospel that he's called us to instead of all the other noise that, that people are clamoring for. Let's, he's given us a mandate. Go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. We have our mission. We don't have to try to make up a mission. He's given it to us. He gives us the organization of the church. We don't have to try to figure out how to structure it like a CEO or like a Fortune 500 company. He's directed us how we are to be and, and what a plurality of elders is to be and, and what, what members of the body are to be to one another. He leads his church. He's given us the method that we are not to trust in the, the tools of men. We are not to trust in the Egypt, and, and that's figurative, but in Egypt or in, in other nations, we are to trust in our God. We are to build the church through his word and his spirit. That's how he's always built his church. As his people take his word by the power of his spirit, he rescues the least likely for his glory. And so we need to be faithful, faithful to his word, taking his word seriously, relying on his strength and his spirit, not trying to make things up as we go along. We need to ask, are we taking our cues from the world? Are we trying to be like a entertainment? Are we trying to be like something that, that we're not? Or are we being what God has called us to be, the body of Christ for his glory, for all authority comes from him? So Paul emphasizes this truth that unity with Christ is a primary way that he uses this picture, this word picture, that the body and the head, that they are to be unified. But the second way that he uses this illustration, he mixes his metaphors. And uh, it's not good for an English class, but, but, but it's good for what Paul's trying to get across. And he mixes the metaphors and he says, not only is it unity with Christ, but it's also about unity with one another. That we are to be unified with one another. That's what makes a body. And, and the second thing we see here is that the body is a beautiful picture of the church's unity with one another. It's a beautiful picture of the church's unity with one another. Now, there are two primary passages that, that, that almost echo each other. They're almost identical in many, many ways. Uh, and they both speak of this idea that God has gifted the body and unified the body for his purpose and for his glory. And so one of them is, is Romans 12, 4 through 8, and the other is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 6. And so I want, to, I want to read them to you. And we're not going to be able to look at every detail in these passages, uh, but, I, but I want you to see the main point that Paul has. In Romans 12, 4 through 8, he says this. For as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Paul says God has gifted the body, for service. And then he lists a number of, of, of ways that he's gifted the body. Now look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. Paul says this, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one men, member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, 
God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, just as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What a beautiful picture that God has given us of what the church is to be. And there are four truths of this picture of the church as a body that I want us to see uh, in, this, in these two texts. The first is this, the body should be diverse. The body should be diverse. We see it in verse 4 of, of Romans 12. He says, for as in one body, we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. They are diverse. And we see it in 1 Corinthians in a few different places. But in verse 14, he says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Right? Thank goodness that our bodies are made up of many different parts that all know what their purpose is and they all have a function. Thank goodness that you are not just one part, right? If you came to church on Sunday and you look down the aisle and there's a giant eyeball sitting there, right? You're not going to be like, hey, welcome to Grace Bible Church, right? You're going to be like, ah! <laughs> like, that is not a body. That is a monstrosity. That is not what you expect. That's not what is supposed to be there, and, and Paul uses this illustration to say, listen, the body is what is beautiful, not the individual part. Listen to verse 17. He says, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as, as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, just as he chose. God places each person in his church for his glory and for his purpose. That's amazing. Do you realize that if you are here, if you are part of this church, you are not here by accident. You are here because God knew that we needed you. That you brought something that our church needed to be the church that God had called us to be. So that we could care for one another and serve one another and be a witness to the world the way that God has called us to be a witness. That is an amazing reality. You know, we need each of you. And we only need one of you, <laughs> but we need each of you, Right? Like, we don't need 50 little fills running around. That would just, that'd be, blah, blah, blah. Huh. we don't want that. We need one. And we need one of you. That God has uniquely gifted you and created you and designed you and given you the story that he has in your life. That you bring something to the body that the body needs. You know, we can think about this in the big universal sense, but Paul is, is definitely talking to a specific church, and the context shows us that Paul's emphasis is on this local church to understand that they together are a body. And this body is not by mistake. It's by purpose. Right? There is no insignificant part of the body. If somebody came to you tomorrow and said, hey, what part of your body do you want to get rid of, right? An arm, a leg, you choose, right? There is no insignificant part of the body. God has designed you with purpose, and he has designed his church with purpose. We need one another. We need our differences. You know, one of the beauties of the church is that we can be very diverse 
And yet we can love one another as Christ has called us. You know, I can sit in a community group with somebody who is completely different from me. You know, they, they like to go hunting. I like to go to the grocery store, right? <laughs> And we can, we can talk and we can pray with each other and care for each other. And by the end of that night, I'm sharing my heart and they're sharing their heart. And we're praying for each other and we're lifting each other up and we're caring for each other. And we have nothing in common except for Christ. We, we, don't, we don't have anything else in common, right? We, we don't like the same music. We don't drive the same kind of car. We don't like the same hobbies. But we have Christ. And that's how God's designed the body of Christ. You know, we should be able to have differing opinions on masks and love one another. And differing opinions on vaccines and show deference to one another and care for one another. That's how God has designed his body. He's allowed us to be diverse in many ways. And the beauty of the body is the diversity of the body. It, it, it is a picture to the world that they know nothing about. That people that are nothing alike can come together in Christ and can love one another because of Christ. It's the diversity that God has called us to. And, 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 and we are to be a witness because of our diversity. So we're not called to just surround ourselves with all people that think like us and act like us and like the same music as us. We are called to be a diverse, beautiful body. Think of it like an orchestra, right? I mean, a violin's great, a cello's great, a tuba's great, but an orchestra is beautiful. If all you have is a giant group of tubas, all right, they can do something, but the beauty is the orchestra, and God has designed us beautifully diverse. Every single person that's here celebrating that, rejoicing in that, not in ungodly, sinful ways, but in beautiful ways that God has designed us. We are diverse. The second thing I want you to see is that the body should be united. The body should be united. In that diversity, there should be unity, a beautiful unity. And while there are many, many things that we can be diverse in, there is one thing that we are to be united in stronger than our, than our diversity, and that is united in Christ. Look what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 5. He says, so, so we, though many, though diverse, are one body in Christ. And we are individually members one of another. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, for what's, what's that unity come from? It comes from, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether we were Jews or Greeks, whether we are slaves or free, all of us were made to drink of one spirit. We are the church because of Christ. We exist to glorify Christ, not ourselves. We exist to serve Christ, not ourselves. He is our head and we are his body. And we are united in a way that far exceeds any of our differences. And we have, what we have in common is that we have been saved by the incredible grace of God. And so every single one of us that are in Christ, we are, we are united with something greater than anything the world can be united with. We are united in Jesus Christ. And we've been saved by his grace. And so when I look at you, I see somebody else that's been saved by his grace. I'm not, I'm not superior to you. I am a sinner like you that came to Christ dependent upon him. It's like one beggar telling another beggar, here's where bread can be found. Here's where life is. And that we are saved by God's amazing grace. And it's a reminder of that grace that keeps us humble. You know, the church had lost that in Corinth. Paul writes to them because they are arrogant in their gifting, saying, well, one gift is more superior than another gift. And Paul writes to them and say, no, 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 no. You are one body. You have all been redeemed by God's grace. And he has made you for his purposes. 
You see, when we forget the gospel, when we forget our unity in Christ, then our differences begin to cause division. Then our differences begin to build superiority that I'm right and you're wrong. When we are unified in Christ, we can sit down, we can listen to one another, we can love one another, have patience for one another, have deference for one another, and through that, Christ is glorified. And so friends, I just want to ask you, where have you allowed pride to begin to build in your life? To where you have begun to show uh, pride against other believers? Where you begin to separate yourself from other Christians? God is calling us to come back into unity for his sake and for his name. Let's ask him to help us remember the gospel that we are all in need of his amazing grace And through that, he is leading us. The third thing I want you to see is that the body should serve each other. The body should serve each other. Paul's point is that God has given you gifts, but they are not for yourself. They are for the body. They are for one another. And we're not to use our gifts just to build ourselves up or just to serve ourselves. Now, that is what our culture would say. Everything you have is for you. So use it for yourself. And and if people get in the way, run over them. Christ would say, I've made you. I've gifted you. But I've gifted you to serve one another, to care for one another, to love one another, to help one another. This is what it looks like to be a body. This body illustration, this body picture, it highlights that every person's gifting and service is essential. If the body is only partly working, the mission is hindered. Paul says in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again to the head, to the feet. I don't need you. Each person is essential to how God has designed us. And friends, if you are missing, if your gifts are missing from service within the body, the mission is hindered. You imagine running a race with only one leg? I mean, you'll get there eventually. But you will not be what, 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 you will not have the, the, run the race that you've been called to run. And the sad thing is that in this consumeristic society, an individualistic society, where everybody's focused on, on me, when that begins to creep into the church, and I just start thinking about the church like a hotel instead of a home. When I start thinking about the church as a, as a cruise ship that I just come on board for my entertainment and not as a battleship that we are called to be on mission together, that we all serve, that we all have our part, that we're all engaged in, the mission is hindered. When commercialism, when consumerism, when individualism seeps into the church, we only function like we have one lung. And other people have to pick up where we lack, and we, the, the mission is harmed. And, and I want to I say this as pastorally as I can. And so I want you to hear me. I want you to recognize and realize that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so what I say, I'm not saying to condemn you or to guilt you, but rather I want to spur you on to love and good works. I want you to understand what God has designed you for and wants you to do. But the reality is, over the last few months, as as we did an internal look at our church, we realized that one-third of our membership are not engaged in serving in an active way. Now, that does not mean that you're not using your gifts in some way. There are multiple things that people can be actively engaged in. There are life circumstances that cause people not to be able to be engaged in service. We have members that are in retirement homes, members that just are are, are in a place where they cannot serve. But I just want to encourage you to think about that. 
We have one third of our members, not just casual people, one third of our membership that are not engaged in serving. You know what that means? That means the other two thirds work twice as hard. That means we have one lung that's not really functioning right. And other people are picking up the slack. And some people are looking at church in a very consumeristic way. And I just want to encourage you to get engaged, to participate. You know, when your gifts are missing, we are missing what God has designed for his body. And, and we're, we're worse off for it when the whole body is not engaged and the mission is harmed and hindered. And so my prayer would be that we would, we would all recognize that we are essential, that God's given us gifts to serve him and serve one another for his glory, and that we would use those gifts. And I promise you, I promise you, it will encourage you in your faith. It will strengthen you. It will help you build relationships with people you didn't know, and you will be better off for it. Christ has called us not to serve ourselves. He's called us to serve one another. And if we're just serving ourselves, something is seriously wrong, seriously deficient. And we need to ask God to help us, that we would grow in serving one another. The last thing I want you to see out of this passage, and it's really in, 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 uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, is that the body should care for each other. The body should care for each other. Paul says in, in verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What a beautiful picture of the church Paul gives us. That this is how God has designed his church. That we would be so united, so in community, so connected, that we would literally feel together as one. You know, it's like when, when you get up in the middle of the night, if you still have small kids and you're, you hear somebody cry and you run into the next room and you, you, know, you step on God's designed, you know, instrument of torture, the Lego, right? And, right, your body, does, your body screams out in pain. It's not like your hand is laughing. It's, it's your whole body feels that. And, and, and God has designed this in such a way that our body functions as one. When one part hurts, it all hurts. When one part heals, it all heals. And, and Paul is saying that God has designed the church in this way. How beautiful would this be for us to be so interconnected, so unified together, so in community with one another, that we would literally feel with one another. The only way that this is even possible is if we are connected and living in community with each other that we are weekly gathered together, that we know one another and care for each other and pray for each other and, and are centered not on ourselves, but on others. And listen, this is gonna take a radical change of mindset. Our culture is so individualistic. You are gonna have the temptation that it's just, you know, it's just too hard. It's too difficult. I mean, I can go home and go back into my garage and turn on my reality TV and there's some kind of false community there for me. But to go and to talk to that awkward person that I don't really know that well or I don't get along with and to, and to eventually, you know, by the end of the night, be sharing that my marriage is hurting and my kids are struggling. And, 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 I have a friend at work that I'm praying for and the others engage with me in praying for that person. Like, that's hard. That takes work. That takes sacrifice. It's gonna take a radical change of mindset. It's gonna take, it's gonna take sacrifice. I just wanna let you know. You're gonna have to sacrifice your time, your schedule. You're gonna have to prioritize it. You're gonna have to say, we have to be there. We have to be with those people so that we can pray together and encourage each other and lift one another up. And I guarantee you, it's going to come and it's going to be like, oh man, it's just, it's, we're so busy. We've got so much going on. It's, uh, do we really need to go? And the church becomes compartmentalized. And people become Sunday attenders. And nobody knows one another. 
And the body is never the body that God has designed it to be. You know, community groups are going to be inconvenient. Family membership nights are going to be inconvenient. They're always going to be hard. And we're going to have to take the, the sacrifice that's necessary. It's going to take effort. It's going to take vulnerability. It's going to take transparency. To say that I'm not okay. To say that I'm hurting. And when somebody says, how are, how are you doing? I'm not just going to say, oh, I'm fine. I'm good. Man, I've been struggling. I had... Man, I, I haven't been in the Bible for two weeks now, I, and I've just allowed other things to push it out of my life. I, I haven't been prioritizing it, and I just feel dry. I feel like my, my prayers bounce off the ceiling and come back at me. Would you pray, pray for me? Would you text me tomorrow morning and encourage me and ask me if I've been in the Word? It's going to take a vulnerability beyond just fine to get to the place where we feel each other's pain and feel each other's celebrations as God has called us to. And it's going to take grace. It's going to take, you know what? That we both need Jesus. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not superior to you in any way. It's not that my life's all put together and your life's not. And woo, that's great for me. We both need Christ. And let's walk together as we walk in Christ, helping one another grow, strengthening one another the way that God has designed us. It's going to take grace. Seeing people through the eyes of Jesus, showing mercy to one another the way that God has shown mercy to us. But how impactful would a community like that be? How would God use a community like that for his glory and for his name? People would see a people that love and care and prioritize one another and walk in truth together and care and, and love one another through difficulty. How impactful would that be for the name of Jesus Christ? You see, that's what God's called this church to be. And we are far from perfect and far from ideal. And we struggle with so much of the American culture seeping into our, our lives as a church. And we, do we just ask God, God, would you help us? Would you help us be the body that you've called us to be? I, I just don't want to be another American church. I just don't want to be a, a place where we preach good sermons and have great programs, but nobody actually knows one another. I want to be a body. And if that means we need to be small, I don't know what it means, but it means we, we need to know one another. And that's what God's called us to be. And so one of the greatest evangelistic tools that we have is our love for one another. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so let's ask God to help us. Let's make the tough decisions that are going to be needed. Let's ask God to root out the selfishness in our hearts and the individualism in us. And let's ask God, God, help us. Make us the community that you've called us to be. Help us be the body that you want us to be, that we would be united with Christ and we would be united with one another and that we would be the, the, the body that you would use for your glory and for your name that many people might come to know Jesus and that you might be glorified. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we recognize, God, our, our deficiency and our dependency upon you. God, we need you. We need you so desperately. We need to be led by your spirit. Lord, we acknowledge, God, that if we do these things in our own strength, we will fail. But God, by your spirit and by your power, you can create in us the community that you desire for us to be. And so, Lord, we acknowledge where we, where we have not walked by your spirit, where we've walked in our own strength and with our own priorities. And so, God, we ask you, would you, would you convict us in the areas that we need to be convicted? That we would not be just those that hear the word and go out and live the exact same lives, but Lord, that we would be transformed by your word and by your spirit. 
And Lord, would you comfort us in the areas that we need to be comforted? Father, I pray that it, it, whatever words I spoke, Lord, if they are not from you, God, that they would be erased and forgotten, Lord. But I pray that you would, you would comfort your people with your truth and your words. And God, I thank you for each person that's here. I thank you, God, that they are not here by accident, but God, that you have brought them because of your love and your grace and your mercy. And I need them. I need them to grow. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, would you help us as the body of Christ, that we would grow as you've called us to grow, that we would walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you've called us, that we would be the body that you've called us to be, that Christ would be our head, our authority. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.